Hello, everybody. I am feeling a little bit under the weather, but I have been waiting to unpack this box ever since I got it. Um, so I'm really excited to be able to share this with you guys. Um, I'll get to it in a second, who H.L. Mencken was, why this is so exciting and so important. Um, I think it's just really fun that because all my work is supported by the Dear Readers, that when I get some cool stuff like this as a result of my work, to share it with you guys because for me, this is the kind of content I absolutely live for when people get cool stuff and you get to share their excitement and opening it up uh, vicariously. I think that's just the best stuff ever. Um, I have, before we get to the Mencken stuff, and let me show you guys how big this box of Mencken crap is. It's this. I can't even lift it up. It's this. This is full of his stuff. And we're going to go through it all, or, as, or rather, as much as I have the time and the patience to do. Before we get to that, we're going to go someplace even more disturbing, not more disturbing, someplace disturbing, which is I have a couple of vintage food items that I have not tried yet, and I wanted to try them on a stream. And the we're going to work backwards. More, most recently and then to the past. So one of the things I love is when you have these cross pollinations, like when you have, I don't know, like if you had a uh, toothpaste that tastes like Lucky Charms, I'd be all over that stuff, right? Well, did you know that for a minute they had at Dollar General or Family Dollar or one of those stores, they had these? It's Pringles. Tastes that tastes like cup of noodles, ramen. And the crazy thing about this is, which actually makes a lot of sense, it's just the flavor packer, right? Um, I tried to get them at the time. I couldn't get them. I figured it's past due. Let me go on eBay and score some. Expiration date, 2018. Uh, the other cool thing about this is... Um, for those you don't know, and it took me a second to realize this, Pringles are not potato chips. They're actually called potato crisps because think about it. I When I was a kid, I thought they sliced the potato a certain way. It's all reprocessed. Um, at some point, you'll have to charge admission to get into your home. That's true. I am a velvet rope person. I get to watch the live stream live. Give you this money. You guys love you so much. Super have right now. Thank you. No, thank you. I get to do it because of you guys. So... We're going to try one of these. I think this is going to taste really good. Like that flavoring is really good. I have a shaving soap that smells like this by uh, Phoenix Artisan Accoutrements. It's called Rock and Ramen. Um, and I, I enjoy using it. So I'm going to pop this open. The, the, the lady on eBay is like, these are sealed, but you can't eat them. I'm like, I can do whatever I want. I'm Michael Malice. So here we go. It's, it's bubbling up, which I don't really like. It, uh, it literally, that can't be good. That can't be good. I'm scared. Okay. It hissed. Once you pop, you most assuredly can stop. Okay. Oh, they're crumbled a little. Right. I'm, I'm, I'm going to get Nankin's papers dirty with my Pringle fingers. It smells like, ooh, mm, it smells like the chicken stuff, but um, there's another, no, no, it's fine now. I guess that was just the, the note of the toxins leaving. I'm just going to, I can't, the, the top ones are all crumbled, but I'm going to try one. I want to get a full one. That's all point in that voice. Okay. I'm going to take two halves. But it's not two halves. Okay. So we got this. Let's try them. These are just like new. And it's really, really good. Like really, really good. And I'm a big fan of chicken and a biscuit. If you haven't had it, it's chicken biscuit, chicken flavored biscuits, uh, crackers. You get them at the supermarket. Uh, these are great. I'm actually going to polish this off. 
Okay, now we get to the really scary stuff. So one of the things that's also, I am a big comic book collector, some you know, comic book character as well. Sometimes when you'd see these old comic book ads, they'd have ads for products they no longer make. And when, especially when I was a kid, I was like, oh my God, I really want to try this. So uh, the best example of this is Slim Jims used to come in like a ton of flavors in the 70s. And let me read you the list of the flavors that they had. It was, where is it? It was the ad with the, um, here we go. So they had mild, spicy, oh, uh, uh, pizza, bacon, salami, and pepperoni. So I really wanted to try that bacon flavor when I was a kid, but it was obviously no longer made at that point. Those ads were um, uh, um, before my time. But there's other things that come in a lot of varieties, and thanks to the internet, you can get the old versions of them, by which I mean lifesavers. I have here a thing of lifesavers that I got on eBay from 1953, it said. And these are the lifesavers clove flavor or sea love. So I went down the rabbit hole. Oh, they still smell very much like clove. I suspect clove was a popular flavor back then because it was for smokers. I feel like clove would cover the, the scent of smoke on your breath a lot. Um, so Lifesavers came in like a ton of different flavors um, back in the day. Let me read you some of them. There was a tangerine flavor. I didn't know this. A lemon, whatever. They had butterscotch and butter rum, which means, of course, I'm going to have to try both at some point. Butter mint. I don't even. Um, then they had lime. That was interesting. Cinnamon, C-I-N-O-M-O-N. -O -O Grape. Okay, that's cool. Then there was also um, orange, lemon, choco mint, and um, fancy fruits. There is a fancy fruits lifesavers on eBay right now. And the, those fancy fruits are apple, black raspberry, pear, and grapefruit. Um, I'm going to actually buy it literally right now so that one of you can't get it from under my... Um, underneath my nose. So I just ordered the fancy fruit lifesavers. What I have here, I had framed in my kitchen um, for a long time is these are two flavors of lifesavers from Australia, which are thirst and, and musk. A little dusty. The thirst tasted kind of like um, Sprite. And the musk is still a popular flavor for candy in Australia. You get like these musk lollies. Ask Sydney Watson about them. She'll know. So I'm going to get a bunch more of these wrappers and frame them all. And now let's open this up. Okay. So here's the wrapper. Pardon my fingernail clubbing. It's genetic. I do not have lung disease. Thanks to all the doctors out there. Okay, I'm opening this up. Ah, uh, ah. Uh, ooh, careful. So there's five left. And let's see if this kills me. Oh, they're, they're, the holes are much bigger than I expected. That's what she said. Okay, this one's cracked, the top one, but I'm sure that it's fine. Okay, it's cracked into little pieces. Okay. So here it's the regular lifesaver. Oh, these are cool. I thought the flavor would be very, very strong because clove is a very strong flavor. It's kind of mild. Maybe it's a function of being 70 years. Jesus Christ, what am I doing? What have I done with my life? All right. Ah, that's fine. Um, it says, they take your breath away is the slogan. Can you read it? It's hard to read on the screen. There it is. I guess so that is the whole point is to freshen your breath. It wasn't just a candy. This was probably for smokers. Let me see if I can get this label wrapper open so I can frame it correctly. Well, this is going to be a process. This seven year old glue. 
Oh, oh. Dang it. Dang it! Mm -hmm. All right. I'm just going to try quickly, very quickly, very quickly. Oh, oh, it's, oh this is, oh, hello. It's, it's happening. Hashtag is happening. It's happening. This is much better than the DeSantis presidential announcement tomorrow. Wow. Here we go. I did it. Awesome. Um, have you ever had the candy called Violets? They're big with the elders in Long Island and NYC. Yes. That company also has a lemon flavor, and they just came out with a guava flavor, which is the odd third choice. Um, and there's also shaving soap scented like them. Okay. So I haven't gone blind. So we're good so far. Now let's get to the Mencken stuff. This is so great. So H.L. Mencken, this crumbled in my mouth a little bit. It's like a soft. So the tech, the formula must have changed over the years, and there go my genitals. Okay, H.L. Mencken was um, a great idol of mine. He was someone I'm inspired a lot about. He had a lot of flaws, a lot of benefits. He was a newspaper man. He was very heavily associated with Baltimore when Baltimore was, I'm going to say correct, Baltimore, but was, was, was really kind of a big up-and-coming city and a prominent city, not like today. In fact, I just recently had a conversation with people how when I was a kid, Chicago and Boston were in many ways rivals rivals to New York. Nowadays, Chicago is a – there was Oprah. There was Donahue. It was a big media center. Now I don't think anyone really goes to Chicago other, other than being like a Midwest hub for a national company. Boston certainly, although you know, there's a lot of people who are uh, mass holes and who love Boston – it's not competing with New York and not that New York is all that it's crept up to be you now these days, obviously. Um, but Baltimore was like, maybe Baltimore was like Austin, you know, back in the day. Now, you know, Baltimore is like a shell of what used to be. And my understanding is, you know, the large people are going to be spilling over from DC to some extent um, to which it's close to. So HL Mink, his house um, where he lived all his life, except for the couple of years when he was married uh, is still there. It's, it's a landmark. It's a museum. Um, Mencken was, let's talk about the good parts about Mencken. Mencken was a real iconoclast. So he is described as a contrarian. I think that's very accurate. I'm hot in here. I'm going to start there. There's two kinds of contrarian. And I, I hate when people call me that because there's two types of contrarianism. There's the contrarianism where your views are outside the mainstream or popular opinion, and you're going to have something off the beaten path. I think that's very admirable. I think that's something I aspire to, maybe successful, maybe not. Then there's the contrarianism where it's just like everyone's stupid and everyone's wrong. And he certainly had both of those sides to him. And the second one I find really kind of gross because if you're going to have the position that everyone's stupid, everyone's wrong, the pressure's on you to always be right. And he wasn't always right. He was wrong about a lot of things. Uh, he didn't really own it. Um, the other thing about Mencken is when you're going to have this – so he regarded Huck Finn – as the greatest book, the American novel of the time. But oh, by the way, his big prominence was like in the 1920s, uh, when he was running his own magazine with um, what's his name, George Nathan, I think was his colleague, uh, called The American Mercury. And The American Mercury was like the. Um, let me let me. Find, I just want to get Nathan's name right, exactly correct. Uh, George Nathan, yeah, George D. Nathan. So I was confused with the, with the green covers. That was like the like intellectual clearinghouse for a certain type of mindset in the 20s. It was like, um, and it wasn't, um, excuse me, like partisan, like today. It wouldn't be like the Atlantic where you're going to have this basically hard left ideology or um, National Review, certainly. It really was kind of a clearinghouse because the divisions in American thought were not as clear cut back then in many ways as they are today. Let me get this question. If you ask, do you think some people are, are worse than others instead of better than others to conservatives and liberals. How do you think the results of those questions would differ? I think that's a great question. I think people would be more comfortable saying worse than better, even though I, I would argue that intellectually there, those questions are functionally identical. Um, so he wrote many books. He was the first person to trans write a book about Nietzsche in English. He in many ways was regarded as a Nietzschean. Uh, there's many of his views that, 
would correspond to what we would regard as right of center nowadays. He was a huge skeptic of government, uh, enormously so. Um, he was a huge skeptic of democracy and, and, and popular opinion. There's lots of ways where he would his views would regard him as put him left of center nowadays. He very much had that sensibility that goes with the New Yorker magazine, this, this urban snobbery. He never missed a chance to take a dump on the South or on religious people. There was a lot of sneering behind what he did. At the same time, there's also this Archie Bunker quality to him. He had he was like low-key racist, anti-Semitic, but at the same time, on a, uh, a broader level, he was very much um, against like Jim Crow and racism and things like this. So it, it, you know, he he's very hard to pigeonhole. He was friends with pretty much everyone. Everyone respected him. Uh, he's friends with Emma Goldman. He's friends with Wallace Thurman, who was my favorite writer from the Harlem Renaissance, who enormously looked up to him. Uh, you know, getting placed in American Mercury was a big deal at the time. Like I was saying earlier, though, if you're going to be sne and he had he was Twitter before Twitter existed. He had so many great one liners. You don't even know where to start. Uh, the last chapter of uh, the new right starts with a quote by Mencken. And that quote, I'll read it right now, is um, every normal man must be tempted at times to spit on his hands, hoist the black flag, and begin slitting throats. That's one of his most famous ones. The other one, which is really great, is democracy is the theory that the common people know what they want and deserve to get it good and hard. So he really did have a way with words. He wrote very, very prolifically. There's another one, um, which is, was often, is often used by lefties vis-a-vis -vis Trump as if it doesn't apply to Biden, which is... Um, uh, let me let me let me get the exact quote, which is as democracy is perfected, the office of the president represents more and more closely the inner soul of the people. On some great and glorious day, the plain folks of the land will reach their heart's desire at last, and the White House will be occupied by a downright fool and a complete moron. Um, so, but the thing about Mencken is, let me get Sam in here. You helped me to be a lot more positive and less cynical. You've inspired me with giving people room to talk about their passions, not joke. I've helped others through you to be more happy and grateful. Thank you, Guru Mike. Thank you. And and I, I this is one of the most toxic, in my view, and I talk about this a lot, uh, aspects of contemporary culture and, and, and the corporate press is this kind of sneering at joy and happiness. And I had a good time. I enjoyed this concert or, you know, I had some ice cream. It's just like, oh, you had some ice cream. Okay. People are starving. People, there's a war going on in Ukraine and you're getting ice cream. Fuck you. Um, Thank you. Thank you. So those are the kind of many sides to Mencken, but it came to bite him in the butt. And here's some examples. Like he was writing that Calvin Coolidge was a fifth rate man or sixth rate man. Four years after Coolidge, you have an FDR. Is Coolidge really so bad? Like Calvin, Cool. you know what I mean? Like if everyone's stupid, everything sucks at a certain point, if you have the dial to 11 all the time, where are you going to go from there? Right. He also didn't have a bad word to say about, he didn't think the Great Depression was going to be a thing. He's like, oh, this is just propaganda. It'll blow over. And then when it didn't blow over, it's like he didn't say shit. Uh, he didn't have it. He was very, very pro-German, not in a Nazi way. He just loved German culture. He hated British culture, again, being a contrarian. Um, but there's a lot to be very impressed with the German culture, the, the philosophers that came out of there, not just Nietzsche, like all of the kind brilliant, brilliant minds. But then Hitler comes along. He doesn't really have to, anything to say. In his defense, what, what is he going to add to that conversation? Um, so I think that the whole like Great Depression and World War II really um, was, uh, as, as stupid as it sounds, jarring for a lot of people because they thought, okay, how bad can things get? It's like, oh, yeah, you watch. And then you've got, you have Stalin after that. So it wasn't smooth. And now. So you think things are bad when it's Coolidge and the Kaiser? Okay. Just just wait and see. Um, just finished the white pill, loved it. After Solzhenitsyn, I think you're the next best author to show the atrocities of the Soviet Union and communism. So thank you. Wow. Holy shit. That's a great compliment. Greetings from Ecuador. Big fan. I hope. Oh, I the capital of Ecuador is Quito. I know that. Um, so you, you know, after uh, FDR came in and it was it was a new deal, not just politically, but just socially. Everyone was just like, all right, this is unprecedented times. What the hell's going on? So his kind of smirkiness is like, dude, like one in four people are out of work. Like we don't have time for this sneering right now. He had a stroke and then kind of died in, I don't want to say obscurity, but certainly a shadow 
uh, uh, in terms of his status of what it had once been. So this is, so if you're going to ask for recommendations on books of his to read, I would say Notes on Democracy, Treatise on the Gods, uh, those are the two to start with. Um, they both really have a lot of great one-liners in there um, and a lot of thought-provoking stuff. He was a big atheist, loved sneering about religion, but when he wrote about it, he wrote about it respectfully. So he's again, he's all over the uh, all over the map in many ways, and that's what I find interesting about him. Okay, so I have here a stack of his papers, and we're gonna go through it as best we can. I'm gonna start selling some of them because this was a, a fortune. This is probably the largest collection of his uh, papers in private private hands. And also, I don't need the whole box full. So let's get through this as best as we can. So they're all signed. So this is, and they're all uh, annotated. We got here, I don't even know who Vachel Lindsay is. That's his autograph. And it is, it's, this is from 1947. It's just eight pages. And it says, oh, this is really, really cool. Look at that. This tribute to the poem, written shortly after his death, is printed here for the first time. This edition consists of 100 numbered copies. This is 68. That is really, really cool. Wow. Okay. What else? Oh, wow. Look at this. Handwritten edits. So this is an essay called... Um, Okay, it was published in the book American Speech. Oh, and this this is hilarious. So this is a collection of names for people from different cities. So an Omaha is a citizen of Omaha, right? And uh, the people of Peterborough, Ontario, are sometimes called Peter Boers by envious persons who accuse them of indifference to arts, letters, and the finer graces of societies. And number one is a Chicago Rilla for a citizen of Chicago. Invented by Walter Winchell, um, had a considerable vogue at the time the late Al Capone was in his glory, and murder was one the, murder was one of the chief industries of the town. Boy, Chicago, I could never believe that. This is, oh my God, this is so exciting. An Okie for an Oklahoman. Look at this. I don't want to get it too damaged, but it's just full of his edits on this essay. So he was a huge um, compiler he, he he wrote several books on the American language. He was obsessed with American slang uh, and how people express themselves. I, I think that's a such a fascinating thing. I used to hate it when I was co-authoring books, how they would correct the text and make it proper English. I'm like, this is supposed to sound like the person speaks. They don't speak in correct English. So have it sound like their vernacular. It just drove me crazy. Okay, what else do we have here? Um, Oh, so his secretary, this is from 1948, Theater Arts Monthly. So she would just collect, I guess, um, articles that he had written and glue them on the page for him. So that's pretty cool. All right. I'm going to try to do this as efficiently as possible. Uh, this is The Future of English by H.L. Mencken. This is an article he wrote from Harper's Monthly. Who cares? Sunshine Rules, my cousin, who cares? Yeah, nothing interesting in there. Uh, you, you got me into Rand and I just finished the Fountainhead. Thank you. I suggest that you read We the Living and Anthem before you do Atlas Shrugged, in my opinion. Ooh, this is, ooh, okay. Hold on, hold on. Oh. So we have here an article from Esquire. They're all signed. That's so cool. That, the article is called An Evening on the House. It was just a memoir of when he was a kid. The land cops who knew Julius when he was a poor flatfoot. Are there any edits in here? No edits. That's cool. That's really nice. Okay, what else? Um, obse obse obsequies? Obsequ obsequies? I've never heard that word spoken out loud. In the grand manner. This is also from Esquire, January 1944. Let's read a page. When I was a young newspaper reporter in Baltimore in days now romantically remote, there were a dozen Class A and Class B breweries in the town, and each and every one of them maintained a functionary who was known in the trade as a Todd, Todd Saufer. So he loved using big German words. Um, okay. What's this? 
Oh, excuse me. I'm going to sneeze. Days of Innocence, An Evening on the House. <coughs> oh, this is another version of that article. Okay. That's pretty cool. 1945. Wow, this is this stuff is so cool. All right, what else we got here? Oh, The American, His Language, which was published in uh okay. Let's read a let's read this. If it were not for the fact that school teacher, oh my god, this is hilarious. I love him so much. You ready? If it were not for the fact that this is the opening sentence. If it were not for the fact that school teachers as a class are the most hunkerous and unobservant folk in all the world, <laughs> the teaching of Orthodox English in the public school of America would have been abandoned long ago. Thomas Jefferson, that sure-sighted fellow, saw clearly that the language could not serve permanently the complex and expanding needs of the American people. The new circumstances under which we are placed, he wrote in Jefferson in 1813, call for new words, new phrases, and for the transfer of old words to new objects. An American dialect will therefore be formed. I did just what I said. Uh, a good example of this, if you look at old dictionaries, I mean old, old, a computer is a person who does math. Now if you call a person a computer other than Lex, you're going to sound like a crazy person. Okay, and this is... A review of American names. This is not interesting, but it's a book review. Oh, this. Uh, so, so, oh, this is how I guess they wrote. So, basically, I can see how his process now. This is really cool. So, the last page is his draft with his edits, right, and then. This is the clean version, and it's glued together. That is so exciting to watch this process. Okay, and this was an envelope in which it was. Okay, we don't need that. All right. What do we got here? Notes on American given names. There's he's got a little note at the top. So this was in Bookman's Holiday, nineteen forty-three. Oh, he's talking about. Adolf and Bonito as names. Hi, Michael. Does Joe Rogan and, and Joe Peter Jordan Peterson know about Hoppe? What are the odds of us ever seeing an interview? Uh, well, Hoppe doesn't do interviews anymore. I think I was I, I was one of the last ones. Update on Roger Ver interview with you. I don't have any updates on that. I don't know what you mean. Eric Weinstein, I don't know that that's are gonna happen. I don't know that they know about Hoppe. I I I would bet a lot of money Jordan doesn't. Joe doesn't, excuse me. And it's possible Jordan does. Moving back to my home state, PA, soon. Someday, I hope someday to return to Arizona. In your opinion, what is the future hope for states like these or Texas? Um, Pennsylvania, I am bullish on. Uh, I went to college in Pennsylvania, as many of you know. Um, Arizona, not so. It's going in a bad direction, not going to lie. Um, Texas, I'm extremely hopeful for. Excuse me, I'm going to be gross. <sighs> Being in your locals community inspired me to create my anarchist sci-fi comic, McKinley Alpha, third issue, which will be available soon. Thanks for the plug. Dude, why didn't you include the link? Come on, man. Come on. People would be happy to support you, and, and that's amazing. Thank you. Malice.locals.com. You can see all the tweets I'm too scared to um, uh, put on Twitter. There's a few of them. Okay. I'm going to read this. On the continent of Europe, there has been little change in given names in a thousand years. Something in the twilight of the da 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 Okay, on the official list of baptismal and confirmation names published in 1935, the Archbishop, then Arch, both Adolf and Benito appear, though the former is a Teut ancient Teutonic no name signifying like a wolf, and the latter is a pet name derived from Benedito. They qualify, blah, 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 blah. Okay, but if Adolf and Benito are included in the list, Winston is barred from it, and so is Spencer, and so are Franklin and Delano. All these names are honorable and even mellifluous. But so far, no saint has ever borne any of them. Hence, they could not be given to Catholic children without coupling them with authentic saints' names. I didn't realize that Catholics had to name their kids after saints, or, or that's preferred. I never heard that before. Um, the chances, changes of mid-Atlantic accent versus American today. Also, I went down a rabbit hole, and the non-Goy calendar is better than ours. If you 
Gertrude Stein, who I talk about incessantly, there's a recording of her reading one of her works, and it's the mid-Atlantic accent. It's just so crazy to hear someone talk about presently. It's just, I, it just sounds like such an affectation for the movies. Okay. Ooh, this is transcript of retirement of E. O. Dunn, Eugene O. Dunn. So this is, it's signed by him. Look at all these white people. Okay. Oh, this is from 1945. That is really nice. And it's in perfect condition and signed on the cover. A little bit of mold at the top left. You can see that. Oh. All right, what's this? Notes for Americans. There's a little tear. He's initialed at the top. So this is a, uh, from Americans, it's a speech he gave, I think. Yeah, repr reprinted from American speech, December, 1947. Um, Okay, this is just very scholarly. Not scholarly, but this isn't going to be funny. Okay. Next. Oh, the, this curled over, but here we go. This is um, War Words in England from no February 1944. Oh, there's, it's like a, it has a, um, it's like a dictionary of slang. Let's read some of them. Gussie, a barrage balloon. Guinea pig, a person evacuated or a soldier billeted. Is that how it's pronounced? B-I-L-L-E-T-E-D. I've never heard it spoken. Finn, used as an adjective instead of Finnish. Thank you, H.O. Thank you, Henry. Liebenstraum, living space, German. Oh my God, that's hilarious. Hurricane, to attack with hurricane planes. Scuttle, to sink. It's interesting what the words that are commonplace now may not have been back in 1944. Lord Ha Ha, nickname given to a broadcaster from Hamburg. After writing the white pill looking at Russia currently, do you think they are at risk of sliding backward into evil USSR behaviors? No, no, I'm sorry. I do not think, think that. I, I mean, they're certainly capable of sliding into evil behaviors, but USSR level, no, I don't see it at all. Okay, what's this? Um, editorial on Truman campaign from 1948. And here's the envelope. Oh, there goes this. There goes the um. There goes the top little piece. And oh, there it is. Okay. Here's the um, the masthead. Oh, it's from the press clippings outlet that he used. Okay. Oh, so this is how they did it. Okay, this is interesting. So they have this. So this is how it works. So you subscribe to this clipping service. Kind of like a Google alert, right, at the top. And then they attach it to the clipping. This clipping from Baltimore Morning Sun, September 22nd, 1948. And there he signed it. So that's really cool with the envelope. Okay. Oh, this is still it. Oh, the is, is this still in the envelope? Um, last Monday. Oh, holy crap. Look at this. Look at this. This is amazing. Last Monday columns herein apparently burned an incinerator. Um, RCL, I guess that's the secretary, left a note on these clips, burned or scorched the incinerator. The last Monday columns of Henry Mencken for the Baltimore Sun, written in 1941, when he quit for the duration of the war. Her own writings are H.L. Mencken were also partly burned or scorched. She was probably destroying personal papers. And this note's from 1971. Oh, wow. Oh my God, this is so cool. Burned or scorched in an incinerator, RCL, 1941. Oh my God, this is so, ooh, ooh, ooh. Oh man. Yeah, they're like, I, I, I'll show you guys. You could see it's not, she didn't do such a good job of burning it. Wow, so exciting. I wonder, maybe he was praising Hitler too much. <sighs> um, I found out that Austin has bat watching season starting in summer. Have you? Will you go watch the bats fly? I did it once. I was very disappointed. There's a bridge here in Austin uh, on co South Congress. It's supposedly the 
the biggest bat colony in North America or something like that. They all fly out one at a time. You think it's going to be like a big cloud of bats. Like sometimes when it's fish school, it's like this huge one mass. It's not like that at all. It's a big disappointment in my opinion. Oh, God, we got so much more stuff here, folks. All right. Okay, we got another, we got a couple more clippings. Ugh, they're all like, I, I'm, they're just delicate, you know. Here's a clipping. More, um, what does it say? Mankins for hanging? Tired of Freudian hooey, he'd squeeze the weasand. What the? In the debate as to what should be done with the murderers who claim to be insane, Judge Herman Moser had injected a sensible idea to wit that they should be done away with as sensibly as possible, as gently as possible, excuse me. Love your insights, and you got a big fan base here in India, so does Hitler. Though due to huge cultural differences, I don't think we will ever be able to see any such practice being implemented in India, at least in my lifetime. India has changed enormously in the last hundred years. I don't need to tell you this. So you never, sometimes it's the rando, not rando, but you know what I mean? The places, like no one saw the Soviet Union going, being the one to go communist. So you never know. Have you talked to Dave about his recent RFK Jr. interview? I have not, but I listened to it when I was in Houston this past weekend. Okay. Another, I'm not going to go through the clippings because they're not interesting. Um, Okay, this is 1949, Esquire. I didn't realize Esquire had been around for so long. Oh, there's something more and stuff in here. What is this? Oh, this is the rest of the article. Okay. That's disappointing. The internet picture lies. Yeah, it's 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 it's, it's disappointment, not gonna lie. Okay, we got an envelope. The crime of this McSwanee, a short story by Mencken. Okay, so that's referring to that. So it was in that envelope. Okay, cool. Oh, so this is interesting. So um, stare decisis was one of the issues that Roberts said when, during his confirmation hearings when he was asked whether he would overturn certain issues. And he said he stands by the issue of stare decisis, which is the principle that uh, once a law is settled, you should try not to undo that law uh, once a decision has been made in the Supreme Court, which he hasn't really held to entirely. So this is from The New Yorker, December 1944. Um, no edits. But I guess it's the original transcript, so that's pretty cool. Okay, hold on. God, this is guys. I don't know what to do. We're not going to get through any of this. I'm making much of a dent. Okay, what do we have here? Tale of a Traveler. This is also from the New Yorker, October twelfth, nineteen forty-five. Let's read a first first page, first paragraph, first sentence. In the West Baltimore of my nonage, 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 now buried beneath the dust and lava of the years, there was a street cleaner named Jock, who astonished everyone by saving enough out of his wages of two dollars a day to take a trip aboard every summer. Don't care. Okay. I know I've got some photos coming in here. A love story. Okay, this is from the New Yorker, nineteen forty-eight. Let's read the first sentence. The secrets of the female heart have engaged authors both sacred and profane since the 3 a.m. of history, but the result of all their labor seems to be indistinguishable from nil. Okay. Good work, Henry. Oh, this is, looks old. This is delicate. Oh, wow. Postscripts to the American language with the edits. This is from the New Yorker, 1949. Very heavily edited. Let me get this off the screen. Yeah. Man, this is cool. Okay. I'm not going to get through all this. This is just not happening. I'm, I'm like a quarter of the way through with that. This is insane. Oh, here's a speech he wrote. The most remarkable thing, 1948, the most remarkable, right after the election, the most remarkable thing about the process by which the president of the United States was chosen is that, in large part, it is entirely extra constitutional and extra legal. The parties which nominate candidates are perfectly free to do it in any way they please, blah, 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 blah. Okay. So this is 
two drafts of it's called potlatch of idealists there's his address at the top I read the white pill before, dear reader. It hit me right in the gut when I understood that the worst of what was happening in the USSR is still happening in North Korea. Yeah, that's not a fun realization at all. Not going to lie. Okay, this is not that interesting. Great. Um, Carbon of original Mac manuscript, a new dictionary of quotations. Oh, so this is like a proposal. So he's laying out how the book's going to look. Let me see if I can. A preface. There will be 40 to 50,000 quotations, illustrations, manuscript delivery date. That's really cool. Historically, has the Atlantic or New York Times been worse for American foreign policy? I think the New York Times, because Atlantic is largely or entirely opinion driven, the New York Times is perceived as objective. The Atlantic couldn't have covered up the Holodomor by themselves. Michael, that's this question last time my timing was off. Are you familiar with Tolkien and his perspectives on anarchism? I am not familiar. I know he was considered an anarchist and he identified as such, but I don't know what he had. I don't think he's talked much about it, is my understanding. A lesson for pastors. This is from 1926, 100 years old. Why there is not a good history of Baltimore, I don't know, and often wonder. Certainly the town is old and romantic enough to deserve one. Okay, that's really nice. Cool story, bro. Okay, next. Five pictures after illness. This is going to be exciting. A Little Night Music, title of a book. Music, okay. It's empty. I guess they went through these envelopes when they were... Is this empty too? Empty. Manuscript submitted by Mencken. This is empty. Okay. So it's telling me what else is in here. Are these all empty? Yeah, so they took them out of these envelopes and, and put them. Okay, I got it. Okay. Okay, so these are all the envelopes. Who cares? I'm going to put them aside. All right, here we go. Oh, Jesus. This is, oh, man, I don't want to get the glue from the envelope on this. Ahoy from the penal Connolly down on, oh, God, poor guy. Surprise, the warden allows your streams out here. Exciting stuff. Word of your writing is spreading through the underground. Big fan. Well, thank you so much, Ryan. That's really nice of you. Okay. This is a box. This is packed envelope. Careful. Okay. Throw this out. Okay, here we go. Okay, here we go. Days of Innocence. Sir did, I don't even know what that says. I can't pronounce that. What's that say? Is that Latin? I don't know what that means. It might, must be Latin. From the New Yorker, January 12th, 1943. When I was a day scholar at F. Knapp's Institute in Baltimore during the late 80s of the last century, a major part of the crime, blah, blah, blah. Next. What's this? Oh, hold on. This is a personal letter to his secretary. Let's read it. Let's see if he had drama with his editors as I do, as everybody else I know does. Um, Knopf is planning to bring out an abridged edition of the American language books. Like I said, he wrote several books in the American language in one volume for use in colleges. The scheme is agreeable to my brother. Knopf has Walter Reed in mind to do the job. Do you have Walter Reed's personal address? Knopf also has in mind a small book made up of my brother's miscellaneous. Oh, this is from Mencken's brother when after he probably after he had a stroke. A uh, small book made up of my brother's miscellaneous articles in the American language, if enough can be found. He seems to think such articles appeared in the New Yorker. Well, we've seen some of them. Um, in, and possibly in other magazines. As I recall, he wrote language articles for the Hearst papers back in 33 or 34. If he did, they should be in his scrapbooks at the Pratt Library. They're still there, the Pratt Library, his scrapbooks. You may recall others. All Knopf wants at the moment is an idea of the amount of material that might be dug up. Knopf thought the title for the new book 
H.L. Mencken's notebook. It, it did come out. A good one, and that is a title probably get. He would like to get the manuscript as you finish it in from 50 to 100 page lots. Each time you send him a lot, write him a letter saying you're sending it and give him the number of the first page and the number of the last page. When you send the last lot, tell him it completes the manuscript. Wow, that is really cool. Oh, so yeah, so there's the there's the letter and there's the, the carbon copy of the letter. All right. What's this? Oh, wait, whoa, 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 whoa. this is something on letterhead. Ooh, fancy. Letter from Siegfried Weisberger. Siegfried Weisberger. To secretary, the enclosed is an outline of a book I hope to work on if years are kind with bristled rage. A sensitivity I will not dare to touch any fullness Henry Mankin left behind. Very sincerely yours, Siegfried Weisberger. This is from 51. It's completely misspelled. Mencken ra raked, ranked, raked alone in Trachka's style with forces of Voltaire, misspelled, in the spirit of the law with the might of Frederick Great, and Thomas Jefferson, the busy man in trading post, gaudy shows, saloons, and domes of God. In schools and campus grounds, the poets, odd professors, swapping politics and clowns. What the hell? This isn't even in English. Oh my God! This is this is uh, this is a crazy person. I, I I never get letters like that. Dear Mrs. What I forget, I can't pronounce her name. One friend writes me to visit Mexico. Another wants me to come to San Salvador. The most precious invitation directs its message from Vienna. Cool story, bro. You are a crazy person. Um, just dropping in. We'll watch later. Here's five bucks. Thank you, Sean. Thanks for all the support. Oh, we got what's this? A postcard from Rye Beach, New Hampshire, to Mencken from, I can't tell, having a dip, hot, dry spell changed by all, I can't read this. Can you read this? Delightful time. Hot day, hot, hot day spell changed to by all day rain yesterday. The motor golf. What bridge? Isn't that a life? Enjoy your pictures. Enjoy your pictures in the Brighton Bard articles. Okay, who cares? Why would you send a postcard about the weather? My God. Okay, this is called Days of Innocence. It's from the New Yorker, 1943. Next to journalists, doctors, liberals, and waiters, I have probably spent more of my time since 1903 with musicians than any other class of men and in the on the whole despite some harrowing experiences i do not regret it not of course that i subscribe to the common delusion that music in some mysterious ways elevating to the psyche and makes for nobility of character i have known some musicians who are plausibly describable as noble at least to the extent that our democratic institutions permit but I've also known some who are unmistakable congeners of the hyena, the crocodile, and the polecat. Okay. Oh, this is a letter from his brother. We got his brother's autograph. He was also a playwright, August Mencken, 1964. Dear Mrs. Lappin, thanks for your kind note. I've not heard from blah, 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 blah. There is no, okay. And here's the envelope. That's cool. Oh, another one from the brother. Um, 1950. My sister writes that she cannot get down Friday for lunch, but we'll hear, be here at 10 o'clock as usual. My brother said for you to come in Monday, but it's here Friday. I've been trying to find some way for him to amuse himself now that the bulk of his office work is over, and it occurred to me that he might be able to do a little printing. He's always very much interested in that work. I believe he could, with a little practice, learn to set type, even if he cannot read. Oh, man. That's after I had a stroke. And I could set him up a small press here. I've said nothing to him. I would like to get your opinion before I do. It would open up a wonderful source of entertainment if it could work, could be worked. A booklet of his epigram, so printed, would be a collector's item. No word has come in from Dr. Wagley, and I've sent out inquiries as to his whereabouts. I hope the villain in this story has not blocked him. That's just weird. Okay. 
we got a little handwritten letter. Letter from F. E. Hayes. Dear Mrs. Whatever, that's the, that's the secretary. I am longing for real news of Mr. Mencken. His condition is a tragic, especially for him. Do you believe he will once will ever be really better? Oh, man. I don't like that. That's really sad. Thank you. Oh, she wrote back? She wrote back? Dear Mrs. Haynes, I can well imagine how distressed you are about Mr. Mencken's condition. His general condition is very good. He showed up to progress. So the fact remains that his improvement has been very slow and discouraging. We've been doing a lot of deal of work, blah, 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 blah. He and his brother are making plans to go to Guatemala in October. He complains very little, and yet he must be suffering keenly. It is horrible to think of a man of his mental stature reduced to doing routine work and depending on me and his brother to assist him. That's awful. Oh, and she wrote back, the lady wrote back later about his health, for your health. Okay, we have here, oh God. We have um, a letter to the Saturday Night Club. Okay, so there's something called the Saturday Night Like Night Club, which Mencken was a part of. And we have a letter here. I guess this is from August Mencken. In view of the Saturday Night Club's decline in recent years, my brother's come to the conclusion previous to his recent illness that probably the wise and proper thing to do would be to bring the club to an end. Despite the commendable efforts to get new members, he was confident that type suitable for club membership was unobtainable and he felt that no other should be admitted. He was particularly anxious to have the club's music library placed where it would be permanently cared for, preferably in the Enoch Pratt Free Library, and the affairs of the club wound up while it was still in the hands of the members he knew. Oh, that's sad. Okay. Oh, there's a little biography of him for something. H. Henry Louis Mencken, American critic and editor of German, Irish, and English extraction, born in Baltimore. Blah, 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 blah. In 1914, to, the, I, the number ones are like the letter or capital I's. They don't use the number one. If you look, you could see how on the dates, you see how the 1917, it's, it's the capital I instead of the number one. Maybe it was just different, that like keyboard or typewriter, rather. Married at 49, he was very happy for five years for his wife passed away, and he more or less retired to his old home for research and other writings. Yeah, he married a woman, uh, Sarah Hart who was uh, ill and she died quite young and just devastated him. Understandably, what is this? I would suggest that fan mail, 1949. I would suggest that Mr. Mencken dictate brief anecdotes about people he has known uh, as Joseph Her Hergshire show and the like. It gives sparkle and space to his thinking and should recall much language. Okay. Do you think the people promoting the undermining cultural norms don't themselves believe in the alternative cultural lifestyle to see them as a means to an end to promote what those such as Gramsci envisioned? Uh, it's a mix. I think very heavily they just want to promote the outgroup or what is currently the outgroup and make them the in-group. And by them doing that, they get to be, they feel empowered. It's, it, think about like when you when you join CrossFit, right? You want to tell everyone at CrossFit. It's like that's like, oh, I found out about this new population that's being oppressed. I get to be the one to save them. Okay, here's an envelope. Oh, here's the letter. Holy crap. Holy crap. This is amazing. Here in a copy of a letter to Paul Hume of Washington, written by Harry Truman when president of the U.S., after Hume criticized Margaret co Truman, Truman's concert recital in the Washington blank, they don't know the name of the paper, Hume suppressed the letter for the sake of the dignity of Truman's office, but HLM, Mencken, apparently had a copy of it, and, and the secretary probably made copies for Mencken's friends. Let's read the letter. Oh, my God, this is a letter, a suppressed letter by Truman. Okay. 
Dear Mr. Mr. Hume, it doesn't say dear. Mr. Hume, I have just read your lousy review of Margaret's concert. I've come. I've come to this is the president. I've come to the conclusion that you're an eight ulcer man with four ulcer pay. It seems to me that you are a frustrated old man who wishes he could have been successful. When you write such poppycock as was in the back section of the paper you work for, it shows conclusively, conclusively that you're off the beam <laughs> and at least four of your ulcers are at work. Someday I hope to meet you. When that happens, you'll need a new nose, a lot of beefsteak for black eyes, and perhaps a supporter below. Pegler, that's Westberg Pegler, who's not a good person, a gutter snipe, is a gentleman alongside you. I hope you'll accept that statement as a worse insult than a reflection on your ancestry. I got to put this on Instagram. Holy crap. That is gold. Oh, my God. I don't, is that commonly known? We have two recipes. Recipe for goulash. And then one for soul. Okay. Oh my God, I love that that um Truman thing. I don't know what this is. Oh, it's it's on the letterhead of the library, his li his beloved library, and it's a review of a book by Waldo Frank. I don't know what this has to do with Mencken. Oh, it's in the smart set. The smart set was his newspaper, his magazine before he launched the American Mercury. From Mencken's diary to be deposited at his death. September 19th, 1944. One of the first cases on record of a patient recovering from endocarditis. Her heart valves, to be sure, will be somewhat impaired, but probably not enough to incommode her. Oh, this is about his secretary. Okay. Okay. Um, let's get something big here. The original type pages from Mencken's diary mentioning Knopf's marital problems. Wow. Let's see what he crossed off. I have considerable doubt that she will have the courage. Ooh, ooh, ooh. Ooh, he crossed this all out. Blanche Knopf told me that advice I gave her a year or so back was bad, and she had resolved to dis disregard it. What this advice was, she did not say, but I assume it was that I had urged her on with special earnestness. That would be disastrous for her to divorce Alfred Knopf, which Knopf is still a publishing house, and marry her so-called Alsatian. I suspect that she has got on to the fact that Alfred has a girl and was resolved to make full use of its bargaining power. If so, she is headed for trouble. Alfred will probably fight, and if he does so, he will fight hard and without any thought of her tender feelings. She has made a dreadful mess of her life and is really to be pitied, but she has played the nuisance so long that I begin to tire of her. If she divorces Alfred, he will heave her out of the firm and will go on more placidly without her than with her. She will find her income very much reduced and existence will be much less interesting as the wife of a non-entity than as the wife and partner of Knopf. I have considerable doubt that she will have the courage to go through with it, for courage is not one of her shining qualities. Holy crap! Jesus! Wow! Holy! Oh, oh, oh! Oh my God! Oh my God! Oh my God! Oh my God! Look at this! Look at this! Nineteen forty-six. Look at this! I'm gonna read you what it says. This is really, really cool. Begun in this is H. L. Mencken, my life as author and editor, volume one. Begun in 1942, halted in July 1943 to make way for the American language supplement one. I resumed in July 1945, halted again, resumed in 1948. This record is to be deposited and received on the explicit understanding that it is not to be open to anyone whatsoever until either January 1st, 1980, or 35 years after the death of the author. Whichever may be the later, signed by Mencken, and there's a space to countersign for the librarian, which she did not do. Let's read what he wants to keep secret.
it's, okay, this is just about him getting a job at the newspaper. It's it's not at all like interesting or or scandalous in any way. My books have covered a wide range, perhaps too wide a range. I have done volumes on religion and morals and language on the women question and politics and a great variety of social matters. All of them have sold sufficiently to bring me good profits. He hand wrote in the word good. Um, you can't see it, it doesn't matter. I was a literary critic for 25 years and enjoyed it more or less, but it always seemed to me to be a vain trade. And so I was glad to forsake it when the chance came. I'm much more interested in what people do than what other people write about it. I'd rather go to a national convention or cover a great fire earthquake or look in on the Montebanks at London, Berlin, or Washington than listen to all the literary gabble ever loosed on earth. All right, there's nothing uh, shady in here. I don't know why he wanted it quiet. Diary note, 1933. Can you please make it clear to my friend that she has no chance of having your babies? That's not true. Sorry. Guys. Guys, this is him talking about having dinner with F. Scott and Zelda Fitzgerald. And he's talking shit. Let me, I'm going to read this whole thing. This is, this is real history in the making. I don't know if this was published, but this is crazy. March 18th, 1933. I think that's right around uh, Roosevelt's inaugural. Presidents were inaugurated later than January back in the day. You can double, please double check me on that. Last night, Sarah, that's his wife, and I dined with F. Scott Fitzgerald and his wife, Zelda. It was a somewhat weird evening. The Fitzgeralds live in an old-fashioned house in the woods near Towson, still, which is still around. There's a college there. I don't remember which college. Almost half a mile off the highway. Its spookiness is not diminished by the fact that Zelda is palpably only half sane. She and her husband moved to Baltimore, indeed, in order that she might be near the Phipps Clinic, and three young doctors from it were the other dinner guests, along with the Fitzgerald's 10-year ten ten daughter, Scotty. The fact that Zelda is somewhat abnormal is instantly evident. She occupies herself largely with painting, and her paintings are full of grotesque exaggerations and fantastic ideas. Fan he doesn't mean fantastic in a good way. Scott himself has also be be also Scott himself also begins, he crossed out the word shows and what begins, also begins to show, oh, because he's the word show later. Scott himself also begins to show signs of a disordered mind. Some time ago, he had what he now calls a nervous breakdown and was in the hands of the psychiatrist for a couple of months. Considering his life during the past few years, it is no wonder that he has come that he's begun to break up. Save when Zelda happened to be in a sanatorium, he has been in close contact with her day and night, and at various times her vagaries have been of a very disturbing and even shocking character. In addition, Scott is a heavy drinker. He has been trying for six years to write a new novel, but remains unfinished. He told me that he had done 35,000 words on it during the past winter, but apparently he's still far from the end. It, I'm, I'm guessing this was the last tycoon, his last book, which was unfinished. I think Fitzgerald died in 1940. Double check me on that. Um, I don't, I, I love this. I think the Scott Zelda story is much better than, and his, his stuff doesn't appeal to me. Like the stuff obsessed with rich wasps. I don't find those people interesting at all. Um, but there's a couple of biographies of him I read, which I really liked. Uh, Sometimes Madness is Wisdom is a great biography of the both of them. Um, meanwhile, he is, oh, holy shit. Meanwhile, he has sought to raise money by writing dreadful drivel uh, for the Saturday Evening Post. This work formerly brought him a large income, but of late the Post has greatly reduced its expenditures, and so the poor fellow is rather hard up. In fact, he told Sarah that at the time of the bank moratorium two weeks ago, that's right, so FDR had a bank moratorium or, or Hoover did uh, during the transition. He had only $300 in the bank. Zelda's illness has probably been extremely expensive with psychiatrists demand extravagant fees and the sanatorium that they operate are run like Palm Beach hotels. Altogether, Scott's situation is very distressing. Apparently, Zelda takes no interest whatsoever in household affairs. She, has not, she had not even planned the sitting of her guests and the dinner had apparently been arranged by the cook. After dinner, Sarah and Zelda sat on the sofa together to talk of their early days in Montgomery. Sarah told me later that Zelda gritted her teeth during the whole conversation. The little girl, Scotty, is very bright but shows a dreadful nervousness. At dinner, she was constantly handling the con candlesticks on the table. Just why we were invited to dinner, I don't know. Scott called up early in the week and said he had to see me on business, but he mentioned no business while we were in the house. 
The evening broke into one of the busiest weeks I've ever experienced, and so I was reluctant to go. Wow. This is good stuff. I got it. I, 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 the person who runs the Fitzgerald Museum in the South, I forget where it's located, made me some custom pillows, which I sleep with and are on the couch still. I got to send her this. I'm going to put this aside, actually, this one. That is amazing. Okay, what do we got here? Oh, 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 oh. I think this is called in onion skin. Oh, this is the duplicate of that thing about uh, don't put this in the library. But he has signed it himself right there in pencil. The H is artistic. The first stroke reaches up to the L in librarian. The second stroke is half the length of the first. The L is a sprawling loop. What the? F they're, they're, they're handwriting sample. They're examining his handwriting. The E is almost an L. The N tapers off and is more nearly a U. The C K E N would be unreadable if not known to be part of the last name, as the C is at one small stroke. The K is a mere. Okay, who cares? Okay. Oh, tracing of his signature. Oh, so that's what this is about. Okay, there's an envelope with his signature in it for some reason. Okay. Okay. Oh, this is from 1942. Uh, sections on his life as an author and editor. Okay. Ooh. Okay, we got some drama. We got some drama here, folks. I recall an incident of which Rosalind spoke regarding the National Institute of Arts and Letters proposal for Mankin for membership. The letter, came, the letter came in when he was ill and someone accepted conditionally for HLM. When he heard he was furious, Rosalind, that's the secretary, after a conference at the house, took the blame and she hid the letter under some papers in a desk drawer. Mencken was so upset she was afraid to let it lie around. He told her later he had never believed she accepted for him. Here's the here and here's the rejection letter from 1950. Dear Mr. Moore, the, he's the head of the National Institute of Arts and Letters, or at least a, a dignitary or authority there. After carefully considering the matter, Mr. Mencken has concluded the gold medal to be awarded to him by the National Institute of Arts and Letters had better not be given at this time. Due to his health, it is quite impossible for him to be present at the celebration in May and it is equally impossible for him to write a statement to be read by someone else. He therefore thinks it's very unwise for the Institute to award the medal while he is unable to accept it personally. He offers his best thanks to the members of the Institute for their kind thought of him and regrets that his condition prevents his accepting the award. Oh, that's kind of sad. What do you think the cultural obsession with rich bosses come from? It never seems to completely go away as a topic. Well, I think because those were kind of the big influencers of the day that they created all the culture back, you know, and they were the ones running the country very clearly. So, and also there's this kind of aspirational element. Like they were considered like, Oh, this is the envelope for that. Oh, Oh, I found the photos. I found the photos. It's a good thing I consider Texas an alternative route to going in case, in case Arizona goes to trash. Might go to near, say, San Antonio or somewhere in Texas. Live no disaster like tornadoes, but then again, the future is never set. Yeah, I just spent the weekend in Houston. I don't understand why anyone would live there. San Antonio also does nothing for me. It seems just like a corporate uh, cultural pit. Memo concerning deranged fan. Let's read it, shall we? For, se For several years past, I've been receiving letters from a woman named May Osborne, whose present address is RD number two, Bel Air, Maryland. She first wrote to me several years ago saying she had written a novel and asked me to advise her about finding a publisher for it. I saw her 
one day at the Sun office and at her request looked through her manuscript. A bit later, I took her to lunch at the Marconi and gave her the names and addresses of some likely publishers. On both occasions, my meetings with her were in the presence of other persons. I've not seen her since and have answered her numerous letters only briefly. Many of them are to be found in a file marked HLM private correspondence on a shelf in the cupboard in my office in Holland Street in case he gets murdered by her. Some time ago, she began to afflict me with amorous suggestions, but I refused to see her further and have informed her more than once that I'm not interested in such doings. Yesterday, June 1st, she called me up at home and demanded to see me. She was in a hysterical state and said her business was a matter of life and death. I refused, however, to see her. She then became much excited and gave every evidence of being insane. I have been in doubts about her sanity, in fact, for a long time and have kept her letters because I feared she would develop into a nuisance. She now threatens to do so. And I make this memorandum in order to show precisely what my relations to her have been. I have never, whether directly or indirectly, made any suggestion to her that justifies her present delusions, which apparently takes sexual forms. Her novel has some merit, but needs extensive reworking. Since advising her about it, I've seen none of her writings, save a couple of brief sketches too slight to be published. Such maniacs constitute one of the chief afflictions of an author's life. Tell me about it. In Sarah's time, that's the wife, one of them made such an uproar on Cathedral Street that I had to ask the police to take her away. She turned out an examination to be paranoid with homicidal tendencies. Wow. Oh my God, that's so cool. I don't, I feel it's so voyeuristic. Okay, here we go. Oh, here are the, here are the pictures, here are the photographs. I'm gonna get one of them framed, I gotta figure out which one. Okay. Get this. Oh, wow. Signed photo of H.L. Mankin with Brother August and Louis Cheslock from 1949. It's a, it's like a negative or something. I can't... How did, Is this like an... I don't understand this picture. Like, what is it? Like, literally, what is it? It looks like a, like a negative. On the... Like, on the back, you see how it's glued? You could make it out, right? So that I'm not going to get framed, but that's very cool. It's signed by him and by August on the bottom, August 20th, 1949. And they drew a cross for some reason. See that? He wasn't religious at all. Okay. Here we have a photo of H.L. Mencken and George Nathan. That's not George Nathan. Oh, he looks so young. Look. Look at that little. He looks like a... That's pretty cool. And then we have color photo of Mencken at Haynes's house in North Carolina from 1940. There's, it's very rare to find color photos of him. And this is the one I'm going to frame. Ah, oh, it's a little crumpled. Oh, hold on. And it's signed. Wait, wait. Oh, they're both signed. Yeah. Yeah, score, um, which is in better condition. I'll figure that out later. Oh, that is so cool. That is so cool. You can be assured that signed Mencken photos are not very common. So there's, oh, this is when he's a little older. He, oh, he's not looking good. That's him sitting down. He's probably too sick to stand. You can see him there. Look how skinny he, oh man, look how skinny he looks. That's him right there. I'm going to put the photos side by side so you can compare him. When he was healthy and then when he's after his stroke, I would guess. So there's that. See that? Let me see if we can. Yeah, not looking so hot. Okay. Um. Ah. Yeah, see? Come on, focus. All right. Okay. Um, guys, we're like a third of the way through. I'm going to go another half hour, then I'm going to bounce. Oh, wait. Okay. What's this? 
Clippings after HLM's death. Oh man, I don't want to go through this. So these are like just newspaper, like like um. What's this? Is there anything in here? It's sealed, but there's nothing in here. Wait, is there? Oh no, there's something in here. Hold on. We acknowledge receipt of your deposit below. It's a deposit, but it's not filled out. Okay, it's a deposit thing, but there's nothing in it. It's not filled out. Um, okay, I'm, I'm going to put this aside. I love that he disavows the woman as insane and homicidal. It takes a moment to say that her book had merit but needed revision. Yes, many such cases. Okay. Ugh. All right. This is how much is left. Let's see what we can do. Good Lord. So much stuff. I got my money's worth. Maybe I should donate it to his library or something. Okay. Oh, wait, wait. There's What's this? Uh, return copies of letters to Hulbert Footner, a mystery writer. Oh, so he wrote a bunch of little letters. These are all... Oh, these are copies. Okay. Copies of letters... 1942, 1942, all right, that's cool. God, there's so much stuff in here. I'm going to put the pictures aside so they don't get damaged anymore. Um, okay, what do we got here? Annotated table of contents for uh, one of his books. Oh, there's a, there's a. I got to figure out which book this is, but. Annotated table of contents. Which smells so old. Oh, guys. It's his handwritten table of contents with the word count. Isn't that so cool? I love that he disavows her despite looking like the offspring of alfalfa and olive oil. Well, it can't all be winners. Income return. He got his money. Oh no, this is his secretary's income return. Her salary is thirty six hundred. Withholding tax was seven twenty. Wow, they took out twenty percent of her money. And her rent was thirty bucks. Okay, that's cool. What's this? Oh, her unemployment form. Okay. Oh, this is um him sending books to the library. Who cares? Oh, hello. Hold on, hold on, hold on. Remember that lady who was getting divorced, Mrs. Knopf? Dear Blanche, Mrs. Lauren Finks, that's the secretary's illness, seems to be serious, and I'm much upset. I begin to realize after 14 years how much of my work she has been doing. Oh, it gets worse. So this is July 27th. This is August 15th. Dear Blanche, Miss Lomfrink, I fear, is hopelessly ill. It is conceivable that she may recovery. He crossed out the Y, recover, but not likely. He really types like a boomer. Look at these spaces in between. It's like the thing is really dr too dreadful. 
I begin to realize how much I've been depending on her. She's comfortable, not in pain. I have enough matter on paper to make a book, but some of it will have to be postponed to volume two. If all goes well, she'll finish the script of volume one by the end of the year. It's a very tedious job. Despite the horrible heat in my state of mind, I'm making steady progress. I guess you don't have air conditioning, yeah. Okay. What's this? Uh, notes. So some notes from his. I did a uh, search on anarcho-capitalism, quickly found left anarchists saying such a name is a contradiction or something that's really voluntarism. Is anarcho-capitalism a farce? I wouldn't say a farce, but from their perspective, and this is like on page one of the Anarchist Handbook, they don't regard anarcho-capitalists as, as anarchists at all. He's defining, is that say Schwarze? Schwarte. Thick, bad skin, or rind. Schwarting, thick skinned. Okay. Copy the font of the little hard that is. Okay, I don't understand what that says. Women are like geographed. From 16 to 22, they probably, he probably means geographers. Like Africa, part virgin, part explored. Women are like geography. From 16 to 22, like Africa, part virgin, part explored. From 22 to 33, like Asia, hot and mysterious. From 36 to 45, like the USA, high-toned and technical. From 46 to 55, like Europe, devastated but still interesting in some places. From 60 up, like Australia, everybody knows about it, but no one goes there. Harry. Oh my God, you bad boy. No one goes there. Holy crap. Okay, I'm going to put this one aside also. This is great stuff. What's this? Mencken signed this order before his illness. It was with her papers. What's this order? These documents and letters okay are to be deposited by my executors on the understanding that they are not to be put at disposal of readers until 25 years after my death and are then to be open only to students engaged in a critical or historical investigation approved after probable inquiry by the chief librarian he's assuming that people would care 25 years after his death come on i hope my letters make it to the crazy lady box i have your cereal right here uh, let me show you amanda's cereal that she sent me oh i should add it i should have um she said, I should have eaten it too because it's part of the, it's, um, period crunch. And it is, hold on, where was the expiration date? There was an expiration date on this. I forget, I couldn't see it. Well, I guess it's gone now. Delicious. Okay. Letter, not interesting. Oh, wait, hold on. We got a little anecdote here. Okay, I don't know what it says. Hold on. Okay, another letter. He, um, this is, is it signed by him? Okay. Uh, the trip so far has been very pleasant, blah, blah, blah. The Holy Land was a grand show. The Christian, sh oh, this is him in Israel. Or this, no, not at 34, so this is Palestine. The Holy Land was a grand show. The Christian shrines are plainly, are mainly plain frauds, but the scenery is lovely. I covered 35, 350 kilometers in one day by automobile and the good roads made the trip very comfortable. I saw some, I got some water from the Jordan and saw a rainbow over the Sea of Galilee, which should give me good luck for 90 days. Let's 
some little thank you notes. Thank you very much for the manuscript. This is the secretary to the secretary. You made a perfect job. Certainly the errors didn't run beyond three or four and all were trivial. My best thanks again. Oh, that's really nice of him. Um, his take on women is accurate and based and funny. Yeah, it's a very funny book, Notes on Women. Or in defense of women, excuse me. Apparently Mankin was the original pickup artist, Red Pill on Women. <laughs> Still offensive too. What's this? It's blank. Dear Mr. Nash. Okay, not interesting. H.L. Mencken found this note from, okay, the secretary found this note from H.L. Mencken after his death and so discovered Christomathy, which is one of his books. Note to, H, note to the secretary, the completed manuscript is on the lower left hand of my desk, drawer of my desk, fastened together by chapters. The chapter and work may be on my desktop. The carbons are in the upper left hand drawer of this uh, left hand drawer of the chest in the west wall of my office. The material not yet edited is in the left hand drawer of the chest of drawers in the north wall of my office. Wow, that's cool. Notes after stroke. Oh no, guys, this is him trying to write after his stroke. See, it says Mencken's attempts at writing. Ah, man, this is some real history. Oh, this is so sad. Okay, I'm gonna show you what these are in a second. I, I wanna put the rest of this stuff down. It's so delicate. <sighs> All right, so this is him trying to write after his stroke. Three hundred pound cigars. That looks fine. H.L. Mencken wrote this memo to order 300 cigars. Okay. Cigars. Okay. To my sister. That's perfectly legible. To Gertie. That's his sister. Six goes cigar. Six something cigar. Here's him working on his signature. Looks like the same. Page 696. I don't know what that's a reference to. That looks perfectly fine. What if the young man who know men and his... I can't make this out. Something about diag about Friday. When I was ill, his degree on Friday when I was ill. I don't know what that means. Okay. Uh, this is really sad. September 1st, 1949. It is difficult for me to handle books. I can, by looking at them, identify what they are about and can very easily give some notion of their value. But for me to read them in detail is completely hopeless. I simply can't do it, even when the thing is short. What this trouble is, I don't know. I know the nature of books and have a very large opinion of many of them, but I can't read them. I am in hope that sooner or later I'll be able to read again some of the books I have read often in the past. Wow. So that's from September 1st, 1949. And this is from September 28th, 1949. Let's look at this. It is easy for me to think of things concerning me, but it is still extremely difficult for me to refer to it in detail. Why this should be, I don't know. I know most of the words and I understand most of them very well, but when I try to lay them down, I get into serious trouble with it. It is very common for a word to disappear in one eighth of a minute. I believe that if I read at length for days, I'll be able to arrange it better. Hmm. 
September 30th, 1949. It is my desire this morning to make some notes for Dr. Hardy. Unfortunately, it seems to be one of my bad days, and it is very difficult for me to put together a letter of any sense. This may work later in the day, but I'm not sure about it. I'm well aware that I'm making speech very badly, and it seems to me unlikely that I'll, ever, that I'll be able to read sensibly for some long time. I see no reason whatsoever for these things, and it's really hard for me to understand the method whereby I, they beat it. The words that I can't pronounce at the moment are nevertheless perfectly familiar to me. Those I can't pronounce are words that are just as natural to me as to anyone else, and I can't quite understand the thing. There is something there is something wrong with my head. This is a nuisance at all times. If I could only read more easily, or if I could read, say, newspapers, I'd be a perfectly happy man. I get some information from the newspaper's habits, but nothing more than a rough outfit. I simply can't read it in detail. As my note this morning shows, it is a bad day, but in all probability, I'll be able to do better later in the day. Why this should be, I simply don't know. These notes show very easily that what words I can really manage, but there are many, many other names that I simply can't pronounce, but then I don't know them at all is unusual, very unusual. I know whatever is told to me and that I've tried as hard as possible to break the errors. And my hope is that I'll be able to read better as I go on. I do not see many people and hence do not have to talk with them. I don't like to go to the Sun, the Baltimore Sun office, because I believe that most of the young men there would not enjoy seeing me. If I can make any progress in this department, I'll get in the habit of seeing them oftener and oftener. Oof, that's tough. That's tough. Unfortunately, it is. this is October 14th, so two weeks later. Unfortunately, it's impossible for me to today to report for it is practically impossible for me to write. I simply don't know what the trouble is. I can tell easily what I'm trying to say, but I simply can't tell the ideas intelligently. I have had today at lunch a talk with my brother our early days as kids in the market in Holland Street, four blocks from our house. We enjoyed the place immensely, blah, 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 blah. Oh, there's another one. This is three days later, October 17th, 1949. Unfortunately, it's difficult for me to make accounts of my books. I can give plenty of notes to my secretary, but I can't write anything of my own that is good. I simply don't. It is a terrible. Oh, man, guys, this is so bad. Okay, my day is badgered to a large extent by people who write into this office. Sometimes these letters are extreme nuisances, and some of them are not above wiring to me. They don't know that I'm ill, and nine-tenths of them who do know I'm ill seem completely unable to understand difficulty and interference with my talk. When they hear that I'm in fairly good condition, they simply can't understand that I can't talk. My condition is just as bad as it ever was. It is impossible for me to read the newspapers. I can tell names, and sometimes I guess what their contents are, but on the whole, it is impossible for me to follow the news in detail. It is a terrible nuisance to me not to be able to read. I simply don't know how to kill my time. I spend my time in, in Maine taking care of my books. The Pratt Library is, is to receive probably 5,000 books from me. Some of these books need cleaning up. I can't read them, but I can at least tell in general what their purpose is. I'm able to put them in shape, and my secretary is gradually making a list of them for the library. I'll be glad to be able to get rid of them altogether. I have spent on the American language too much time, and I'll be glad to cut it off eternally and forever. That's a series of books you were, like I said earlier. It is, of course, impossible for me to send most of my material now, for I can't study it. Jesus, poor guy. I can't understand why I'm upset. This is October 18th. Why I'm upset by some of the simplest words. Most of them are completely beyond me. Nine tenths of the time, I remember the words that I want to say, but it's difficult for me to say them. And when I, when I begin to hunt for them, it gets more and more difficult. All right, let's go through one more envelope. Whew. I've got four more envelopes to go through. I'll, I'll go through one more. The top one. Oh, wait, there's two envelope, little envelopes here. So this is note for the letter. Okay, that's not of interest. And then we have this.
I don't know what this is. It's not interesting. Um, oh, these are some quotes. Anonymous from the book Against Marriage by, from, 1960, from 1690. Mencken had books of quotes. By day, tis nothing but an endless noise. By night, the echo of forgotten joys. Ye gods, that man by his own slavish law should on himself such inconvenience draw. About, that's about marriage. Okay. That's nice. And this is from 1947. What are here? It's in here. Copy this clipping, omit all footnotes. It will be time enough if I get the case. It's not interesting. Okay, we're going to go through one more envelope, then I'm going to bounce. Oh, God. Okay. These are more letters of his that continue after that. The truth of the matter is that October 19th, the truth of the matter is I could think of things very slightly. It may seem incredible, but it's a fact that I can spend more than half an hour without thinking at all. I suffered much worse in the early days of my illness than I feel today. There's always something I can occupy myself with in the house. If I begin to read it all in six months, I'll consider myself a happy man. I'd like to, this is the next day, October 20th. I'd like to give my secretary a new note this morning on thinking, but I should add at once that is almost impossible. My talk on work is more and more difficult. It seems to me that I'm really worse than I've been in the past. It's difficult for me to talk of small matters. I can only get a few words and then get caught on errors. I don't know why this change has occurred, but it's obvious I'm not as good as I was, say, two or three weeks ago. It is more and more impossible for me to talk to people, even my brother. For one reason, of course, I try to do better and so make a mess of myself. Mess of myself. There was a time when it seems to me I could really say long words with reasonable care. They are apparently gone. What is the matter with my state? I simply don't know. All I can say of it is that it's very bad. And then we have a note from the secretary. After the first sentence, Mencken said, I'll start again in a few minutes if I can hit it. It is a complete breaking up of my whole system. I'm completely sunk. I don't know anything. This is not fun. And there's for the next day. So I'll just leave this here. Just him talking about talking, visiting Kanaf. Alfred Knopf, who came in to see me Friday, October 21st, reported to me that the sales of the Crestothomy so far have been between eight and 10,000 copies. That is remarkable. The men of his company were convinced that they would fail with it, but they were wrong. The book is still selling fairly well. Ha <laughs> ha. Okay. This is just really sad. This is more, oh, this is just more of him talking about not being able to talk. November 3rd. Here we have September 6, 1950. I'm oh my god. I'm gonna be I'm gonna I'm gonna guys, this is really rough. September 6, 1950. I'm convinced that my condition will not improve and that I'll pass out at least at last a complete idiot. My mind is curiously hopeless. Whatever I say must be in the condition of certain occasional statements, and is usually impossible for me to quote them. I haven't the slightest idea what my state is. When I try to get my idea, it turns out to be an obituary mess. Last night for a couple of hours, my brother Charlie came here with his new wife. She'd been, she's been married before and has two children. She seems to be a pleasant woman, and she and my brother seem to be getting along splendidly. He's only 20 months younger than I am. It shall, Mr. Mankin started a sentence he could not finish and said, what is the sense of my making such idiotic things? I simply can't do it better. There's no improvement, whatever my condition. I realize thoroughly that I'm done for, and I begin to realize that I've lived too long as a damn nuisance. 
I can't talk to anyone except with difficulty, and it's almost impossible for me to say things myself. Hmm. Okay, I um, I wanted to end on like a nice happy note, but like, oh wait, there's a letter from Kanaf. Let's let's end on this and the trending of the Treasury Department. Okay, this is an interesting. Uh, something for the Treasury Department. Another thing from the Treasury Department. All right, I guys, I'm going to cut this short because this is bumming me out. I'm not going to lie. I thought this would be like nice and fun. And um, and it's just him and, you know, in his decline, which is something you don't like seeing, you know what I mean? You want to remember people as they are at their best, people that you like, not as they are at their worst. So I'm going to go through these and, oh, who? wow, look at this. So I knew this was in here. We have um, a part of the secretary's memoirs, which were never published. So I'm going to read those um, at some point. Okay. Um, pages one to 30. Okay, folks, I hope you – oh, this is a whole huge thing. I hope you found this of some interest and value. I will see you on the internet soon. Um, remember him as he was. Um, I'm just going to leave you with one of his great quotes, which is, if after I depart this veil you ever remember me and have thought to please my ghost – Forgive some sinner and wink your eye at some homely girl. That's you. All right, folks, I will talk to you soon. Have a good one.